let me first uh, thank our host uh, KDI for allowing us to, uh, to have this conference here and for organizing it so uh, totally flawlessly. Uh, let me uh, then indicate that this is a paper I've written with uh, John Maria Milesi Ferretti, who is sitting somewhere in the audience that may uh, help me answer questions later. Uh, global imbalances are, are again uh, in the news, and, and there are many questions whether they are gone, uh, if they are not, at what rate they should be uh, reduced, who should do what. Our sense, uh, looking at the debate, was that it was a somewhat confused debate, both at the theoretical level uh, and at the empirical level, basically the examination of facts. So this paper really is an attempt to, uh, to get the theoretical argument uh, straight and to look again at the empirical facts and then draw implications for what we may want to do uh, going further, uh, going uh, forward in time. So this is, this is the roadmap. The, the first on the theory is, is, is a basic point, but I think a point which is important, which is that there is no point in reducing imbalances per se, because imbalances can be good or bad and you need to know why they are bad, if they are bad, uh, and to act on the causes rather than on the imbalances themselves. And I'll go through this uh, in the first uh, third of the presentation. Then the second part is on the evolutions, starting in 1996, because it looks as if this is the time when something uh, started happening, looking at uh, the pre-crisis periods, which will uh, basically divide in three periods with we think very different characteristics as to who was doing what. Uh, then looking at the effects of the crisis on global imbalances and as you know uh, they have uh, reduced quite considerably and then thinking about the likely future evolutions and then having made a diagnosis of where we are and where we're likely to be absent changes, uh, think about what can be done to reduce the bad part of imbalances. Uh, reducing distortions and reducing systemic risks. So let me start with uh, the first third, which is uh, a bit academic. Uh, John Lipsky would say too academic probably, but uh, that's where I come from, that's how I think, uh, which is let's just go back and see why is it that we don't like uh, global imbalances or we don't like some of it. Now the first point, there's a missing slide, which is the good imbalances, and we all understand that in a perfect world, there would be imbalances to the extent that there are differences in saving behavior or in the productivity of capital or in risk attitudes or risk characteristics of assets. We understand that in that world, we wouldn't want to reduce the imbalances. The question is, can there be bad imbalances? And yes, there can be bad imbalances. And conceptually, they can come either from distortions, which are the cause and create the imbalances, or they can come from factors which by themselves are perfectly reasonable, good factors, but have implications for risk uh, for imbalances that we have to worry about. So there are two slides. The first one is on the distortions, and then the next one is on the risks. So what are the, the distortions that uh, will give rise to imbalances? They can be either domestic or systemic. Domestic distortions, there the list is fairly familiar. You might, for example, have a country where the saving rate, the private saving rate is high because people do not have access to the kind of social insurance that the state could provide or should provide, in which case they save a lot. In this case, there's clearly a distortion. It's going to lead to a large saving rate and other things equal to a current account surplus. You can have the opposite uh, of this, which is you can have economies where you have bubble-driven asset booms, which make people feel very wealthy. As a result, they save very little, and then the country has a current account deficit. Now here again, the important word is bubble-driven, because if it was a true increase in wealth, then it is normal for people to save less, and for the country potentially to run a deficit, but in the case of bubble-driven asset booms, it's not. Then you have been focusing on, on, the, on private uh, savers, but as we know, the problem may come from the public sector, basically excess uh, public borrowing, uh, which itself is going to lead to a current account deficit. So these are domestic distortions. You may have 
systemic distortions, and here I, I give two examples, but I'm just going to uh, focus on the second one in the interest of time, which is the uh, accumulation of reserves, which we can see basically as something which is completely rational at the level of a country. Basically, it's a way of self-insuring against the shock, but is systemically extremely inefficient. It's like precautionary saving for individuals. It should not be done that way. They should basically have access to, to insurance and not self-insure. The same thing is true of countries. This is a case in which countries are doing the right thing from their point of view, but collectively, clearly the outcome is not very good. This leads to excess saving, current account surpluses in a number of countries, and so on. So these are distortions. And when we see this, basically the attitude is, well, we should remove the distortions. And this will imply a decrease in, uh, in imbalances. Uh, we don't care about the decrease in imbalances. We care about decreasing the distortions. But uh, we have this as a side effect. On the risks, now here I'm thinking of a world in which the factors which are driving saving and investment might be the right ones. But for some reason, this creates uh, risks which are uh, dangerous and should be avoided. So in the case of domestic risks, probably the, the best known one is the one which arises when, for example, you have uh, a large increase in natural resources. So the Dutch disease, something very similar can happen if the rest of the world falls in love with your assets and comes uh, in the form of large capital flows. In this case, what happens is that you may have a current account deficit or a current account surplus, depending on the two cases I've given, uh, which uh, may create problems for the economy later in the sense that you have an appreciation, you have an increase in the price of non-tradables, and it's difficult basically to undo it later. And you may suffer from it, although you didn't sin in any way. Uh, and uh, it should probably have been avoided in the first place. In the case of systemic risks, there's this notion which I think is a bit fuzzy, which is that large imbalances may lead to large shifts, which are not only bad, large shifts in capital flows, which are not only bad for the country, but may be bad for the system as a whole, creating exchange rate uncertainty and so on. The reason I think the argument may not be totally convincing here is that when you think about it, it has much more to do with gross positions than net positions. Basically, what can go out or what can go in is really the gross positions. And so you can think of a world in which there would be no imbalances. There could still be very large shifts as a result of changes in investors' preferences. So here I think the debate is not entirely clear, but clearly there is some systemic risk associated with these cross flows across countries. So that's all for, for the theory. The uh, problem is how to, when you start and look at the data, how you basically call something good and something bad. And this slide is, is a way of indicating that the map from these arguments which I've given to reality may not be obvious. And I've chosen a very controversial case. And it is useful because it shows how the same, different people looking at the same reality can have different interpretations, call it good or call it bad. So I basically have, I'm looking at China, where we know there is a large current account surplus. And I'm going to give you three interpretations. And I'm not going to say which one I prefer. These are three interpretations which have been given by various people uh, in that debate. So the first one is that the high Chinese uh, saving rate reflects cultural factors. And in this case, if you have a high saving rate, then the only way you maintain full employment in the country is by having a low exchange rate. You have low domestic demand. You basically need large external demand that comes with a low real exchange rate. In this case, the conclusion would be that if you don't think that the cultural factors are wrong, nothing should be done. This is basically a good current account surplus, indicating that the country is saving a lot. And this exchange rate is just a way of moving the capital uh, into the outside of the country. Now, you have a variation on this theme, which I think is probably more relevant, which is that the high saving rate does not fundamentally represent cultural factors. If it did, it would be difficult to explain why it has steadily increased in the recent past. But it reflects the under-provision of social insurance and various governance problems which, uh, uh, which, which uh, Chinese firms are subject to. This could potentially explain the trend in the, in the sense that there is an argument that social insurance was actually better in the past than it is today in a number of dimensions. But if you take these, uh, this non-existence or this under-provision uh, under of social insurance as given, 
then the conclusion is the saving rate is whatever it is for the moment, and therefore you still need, in order to maintain full employment, a low exchange rate. Now, the conclusion here is that there is a distortion at the start, which is this under-provision of social insurance. So you come to the conclusion that the exchange rate is right given the saving rate, but the saving rate is not best. In this case, the argument is the exchange rate is fine given the saving rate, but try to decrease the saving rate by basically providing social insurance. And when you do this, you may have to actually ac accept an appreciation of the exchange rate. Okay. Then there is a third way of looking at the same facts, uh, which you have also read about in, uh, in articles and elsewhere, which is that, in fact, the saving rate is really not to be taken as given. There is an intentional undervaluation of the exchange rate by the Chinese authorities, maybe to maintain export led growth and benefit from productivity growth. And in order to sustain this and not have overheating, then they have taken a number of measures which basically make the saving rate very high. In this case, the angle is a bit different. The problem is they chose a very low exchange rate, and then they basically made sure the saving rate was consistent with full employment, in which case you can argue that that's bad and that should not be allowed on a number of grounds, uh, including maybe unfair competition. These explain the same set of facts, and therefore whether something is good or something is bad is not as obvious as I made it in the previous slide, but I think that explains why the debate is sometimes so difficult to have in, uh, in productive fashion. Let me now move to the second part of the, of the paper, uh, which is and the general theme is if you look at imbalances from 1996 to, to, to just pre-crisis, uh, there is one common feature, which is the, the large current account deficit of the U.S. On the other side, you actually have a number of players who come in and out, but there is this uh, constant aspect to uh, what has happened, and this leads people to think that, well, maybe it's just one explanation for the last 15 years. When you actually look at the 15 years, 19, 1996, well, it's not 15, 1996 to 2007, stopping just before the crisis, I think there are really three different phases to global imbalances, going beyond the apparent continuity of the current account deficit of the U.S. You have, from 1996 to 2000, uh, an investment boom in the U.S., justified or not justified, I think, we put, you think exposed, probably not fully justified, but ex ante largely justified. It looks like productivity growth was high. At the same time, you have the end, you have the, what followed the Asian crisis. You also have Japan being in trouble, so not places where you're eager to invest, and therefore what we see is high investment in the US, low investment in Asia and in Japan, emerging Asia and in Japan, and this is very much uh, what is happening uh, during that time. Uh, then, although when you look at the figures, you don't see a radical change. The nature of the imbalances changes, so we have some somewhat arbitrary dates here. But from 2001 to 2004, what happens is very much a change in the source of the current account deficit of the U.S., which is investment decreases very much with the stock market collapse, the end of the high-tech bubble, but saving uh, decreases very much and saving decreases because of an increase in public saving fiscal deficits. So although the picture looks very much the same, the reason why we have a current account deficit in the U.S. changes somewhat. What you have on the other side is increasingly the oil producers because the oil price is increasing. But I think the important change is basically in the nature of the main board, which is the U.S. And then you have uh, period 2005, 2007, or 8 pre-crisis, in which on the borrowing side, on the current account deficit side, you still have the U.S. continuing, uh, but you have many other players coming on the deficit side. And these are the countries which have asset price booms, housing booms, which we see uh, in trouble today, which basically come in. And their deficit actually starts looking quite big, even relative to the U.S. On the other side, what you have is the oil producers again, because the oil price continues to increase, and they are saving a good part of it, and China coming to the scene. China coming to the scene is not something which is true of the whole period 96 on. It is really something which 
quantitatively becomes important during that period. So the point here is that when you want to analyze imbalances and you want to say this is good or this is bad, you really have to say now, in the past, at what point, and so on. Now, I have a picture here which describes all these things uh, in, in, in color. I decided I would show it to you, but not go through it. Uh, the points that one can draw from this figure are very much the points that uh, I have made before showing you the figure. So there is now this interesting question, having said why well, it's really hard to know whether the imbalances are good or bad. Let's still try to go and try to basically put labels on the various causes, the various things which were behind the, the, the imbalances. And so I've made two lists. The first one is good imbalances namely imbalances which we think were due to the fact that investment was more productive in part of the world or saving was high in part of the world. And I would put here three uh, causes of imbalances. The first one is the U.S. productivity boom of the late 90s. Again, that's an ex ante statement, uh, but productivity growth looks good. There were good reasons to have these imbalances then. The second is, I said part of here, but I would say the beginning of the convergence deficits of a number of emerging market countries or even the uh, relatively poor countries of the uh, euro uh, on the assumption that they were going to go faster then it made sense for them to actually have a lot of investment coming in and saving being relatively low and that's what they did. Now, I think what we know is by the end and when the end is, whether it's 2006, 2007, they had gone far beyond where they should have gone but fundamentally for them to have deficits was something good. The third good aspect of imbalances was the saving by the oil exporters. As the oil price was increasing, it made sense to think that it was not going to last forever, or it made sense not to increase spending at the same rate as revenues, and therefore these increasing surpluses of oil exporters are again, I think in my book, good ones. But what's interesting about these factors is that for, to a large extent, they are relevant for the past. And if you look at the imbalances just pre-crisis, I'm going to come to the crisis in a minute, uh, basically the source of them, the main source was US fiscal deficits, and I've not heard anybody say that there was a good reason for this. Uh, excess saving in China in the sense that I've mentioned, which is the, the lack of social insurance or poor governance in firms leading to excess saving, and then the third factor, which became increasingly important uh, before the crisis, was again self-insurance, uh, globally excessive, individually rational maybe, uh, but globally excessive reserve accumulation. So I think that just pre-crisis, what we had was mostly bad global imbalances. Now, there is a question which I'm not going to go into, which is whether the global imbalances contributed, triggered the crisis. My own view is to a very marginal extent, but that's not central to the argument I want to make today, and I want to move on. Okay, so let me now describe what has happened with, uh, with the crisis. Well, let me go back to this graph. So the last two years are the, the years of the crisis, and you can see just visually that the deficits which are on the, on the line under the horizontal axis have become a bit smaller, the surpluses have become smaller and even more so in 2009. So the imbalances have been considerably reduced. They haven't been eliminated, but they have been considerably reduced. And the question is why? And there is a list of answers, and I'm going to give you some, and I think it's important to analyze exactly why in order to know what will happen in the future. So the first thing is lower oil prices. And a major contributor to the imbalances, a good one fundamentally, was basically the surpluses of the oil uh, producing countries. With the decrease in the price of oil, the surpluses have shrunk enormously. That's one thing, decrease in balances. Now, the countries which had asset price booms, to a large extent, have gone through a very difficult adjustment, having to reduce demand, having to basically contract their current account deficits. So there has been a drastic decrease in the deficit of the countries which had asset price booms. The third one, is something which was very acute in the worst two quarters of the crisis, 2008 fourth quarter and 2009 first quarter, which is the reduced willingness by foreigners to basically 
put their capital abroad. So reduced willingness to finance large current account deficits. So all these factors have played, and basically that's what explains the reduction in, in, in global imbalances. Now the question looking forward is, if we don't have major changes in policy, what's going to happen? Well, it's likely that oil prices will go up again. They are. Uh, and therefore, these surpluses are going to reappear. There might also be a number of uh, structural changes. Uh, it may well be that private saving, for example, in the US uh, will be higher than it was before the crisis, even when wealth levels have been reestablished, even when output has gone back to normal. There might well have been a change in behavior uh, which will translate into a smaller current account uh, deficit. Um, the last part is, I think, very much a question mark, which is the question of this higher risk premium on cross-border capital flows. It was very strong during the crisis. It seems to be going away fairly quickly. If it remains, at least in part, this implies that it will be harder to finance deficits and other things equal will lead uh, to a lower uh, set of imbalances. So let me now move to the third part of the presentation, which is looking forward, uh, what are the various scenarios? And here, somewhat arbitrarily, uh, we have constructed what we call an ideal scenario and then two risky scenarios, but uh, imagination would easily allow you to have more than two risky scenarios. So the ideal scenario, if you accept the argument that most of the imbalances pre-crisis were bad, the US deficit, the excess saving in China, and the large am amount of reserves, suggests that the ideal scenario would have a gradual adjustment in the US fiscal position, so a contraction in overall saving in the US, uh, that you would have lower saving uh, coming to avoid overheating with an appreciation of the RMB and the lower surplus in China. This would lead to higher net exports in the US, uh, lower net exports uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, and then the, I don't know how I wrote that. I think the third one is a decrease in reserve accumulation either a decrease in reserve accumulation or a decrease in reserves, talking about levels, uh, in emerging Asia and in the rest of the world. And we think that under that scenario, basically this would provide uh, enough demand in the US and in the rest of Europe in the form of basically increased net exports. It would allow China to continue uh, to go fast by moving towards domestic demand. It would decrease the current account surpluses of a number of uh, emerging Asian countries and this could sustain uh, growth at the world level. Now, this is the ideal scenario. Uh, the risky scenarios, let me just again give you, give you two. The first one is not much happens in China. There's not much adjustment in the saving rate, therefore not much adjustment in the exchange rate. Uh, this means that in the US, net exports don't improve very much. As a result, there is enormous pressure to continue the fiscal stimulus in the US. And so what we get is we basically get something which is back to the past, in which we have large deficits in the US, low saving, continued global imbalances, and in addition, uh, fiscal sustainability issues becoming more and more relevant in the US. Now, there's a variation on this scenario, which is risky scenario two, which is, again, not much happens in emerging Asia, uh, no saving exchange rate adjustment in China. And again, I'm exaggerating just to make the points very clear. Uh, the US feels that it cannot continue to run large deficits, has to basically exit from fiscal, but it does this without having the private demand and the net exports, which would sustain growth. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what you get in this case is a slowdown or maybe just a, a stop to the recovery that we're having now, which would be bad uh, for the US, bad for advanced countries, and bad uh, for the world. Now, what are we going to get? Uh, it's very difficult to say. The, our forecast uh, in the World Economic Outlook are somewhere in between the ideal scenario and the risky scenarios. And so basically what they assume is that there'll be some adjustment in China, some adjustment in the US, but it will reduce global imbalances, it will not sustain strong growth. And that's what we think is more likely. Now, given this, 
let me move to uh, what can be done. Uh, well, what can be done is to try to get as close as possible to the ideal scenario. And here I want to uh, basically talk about what we can do with domestic distortions and then what we can do about systemic risk. So for domestic distortions, the idea is the U.S. basically increases saving and the rest of the world, in particular emerging Asia and China among them, decreases saving and basically we get this readjustment. And the question is, at a qualitative level, that sounds just right. The question is quantitatively, is this going to do enough? Is this going to do the job? And we've been doing a number of simulations uh, at the fund using the best machine we have, which is a large five region DSG, uh, DS DSG model, uh, which allows to think about these issues, has these limitations, but allows us to think about these issues. And I want to briefly show you some of the simulations that we have done, which I think are interesting. So I'm going to show you three simulations. The starting point, everything is going to start from steady state. I'm going to have what we think the first part of an adjustment has to be, which is an increase in saving in the US. Well, this by itself leads to a contraction of demand in the US and leads to a recession in the US and leads to a somewhat smaller recession in the rest of the world. That will be the first scenario, which I'll show you. Then I'll say, what can the rest of the world, in particular emerging Asia, do, which would basically avoid some of these bad, uh, of these bad effects? So the second scenario, or the second uh, simulation I'm going to show you, is going to have, again, the increase in saving in the US, but now a decrease in saving in emerging market Asia. So it's larger than China, uh, but it's still much smaller than the US as a whole. And so what you have is basically, in this case, a boom, uh, an increase in demand in Asia, which has an effect on Asia and has spillover effects on the rest of the world. Then the third and final simulation will say, well, let's do this, but let's do this in a way which does not create a large increase in output in emerging Asia. So let's combine the decrease in saving in emerging Asia with an appreciation of the currencies of emerging Asia by 20%. So we have a combination of increase in saving in the US, decrease in saving in emerging Asia, and a 20% appreciation of emerging Asia uh, currencies. And now that I have set the stage, let me show you the result. And so this shows the effects on uh, four of the five regions. I'm going to focus just on the United States and emerging Asia. The, 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 the two top two graphs. So the first simulation is just an increase in saving in the US, or another way of saying this, a decrease in aggregate demand in the US. And that this gives you the red line in both graphs. So you get a fairly large recession in the US, and you get a smaller recession in emerging Asia, which comes from the fact that uh, the exports decrease. Well, that has some effect, but the effect is much smaller. Then emerging Asia does something symmetrical and decreases its saving rate by 2% of its GDP. And so this gives you the blue line. Now look at the emerging Asia part. What this does is basically much more than offset the adverse effect of the US contraction. It gives a boom in emerging Asia, which to some extent benefits the US. You can see that the blue line for the US is uh, less bad than the red line. Then, third simulation, there is the decrease in saving in emerging Asia combined with an appreciation. So that for emerging Asia, you get the green line, which is that some of the increase in demand coming from lower saving is offset by the appreciation and the decrease in net exports. So to a first approximation, emerging Asia remains more or less the same, but the two effects go in the same direction for the US. The US sells more uh, to, China, to, to emerging Asia and uh, there is the exchange rate effect which further contributes to that. Now, the reason we did this was to get a sense of magnitudes. And I think that, again, within all the, with all the caveats which come from using these models, I think the magnitudes are reasonable. And what this says is if we got this combination from emerging Asia, emerging Asia would be roughly in the same place with a change in the composition of demand, and the US would be in a better place by roughly 1%. Now, 1% is not nothing. This is the difference between the red line and the green line roughly. 
she's policies going forward now looking at the systemic aspects, so attacking systemic distortions. And here it's clear what the uh, potential uh, victim uh, is, which basically is uh, can we basically get smaller accumulation of reserves on the part of uh, many emerging market countries. And the answer is they do this for reasons which make a lot of sense to them. What could we do to basically change behavior? And the answer is, as somebody said earlier, provide global liquidity. And the idea is if we could provide global liquidity to countries so that they knew that when they needed liquidity, they didn't have to accumulate it ex ante, but they could come to the fund in this case and get it, then this would have some effect on reserves. Now, I think that's just the beginning of the answer, uh, in the sense that it's difficult for the IMF to just provide liquidity in the same way as you would get if you accumulate reserves. Namely, there has to be some ex ante conditionality, if not ex post conditionality. And the other thing is that I think there's other reasons why emerging market countries are accumulating reserves at this point, which is to prevent appreciation, at least to some extent, and that would not be taken care of uh, by offering uh, global liquidity. So here we have to think much more about what can be done. These are the directions in which I think we have to go. Let me stop here. <laughs>